Welcome back to Grim Advice with Greta Myers. You've entered the grimoire with two limbs. Let's turn the page together. Again! Because this is our first cliffhanger. Because the story was really, really long. And because of life today, I'm only going to be finishing the story and analyzing it, not going on to the next one, which means no Saturday special this week because we will just finish this week's slate. Sound good? Yeah, it, it's good, it's fine, it's great. Okay. So, back where we left off. Let me do a quick recap. Um, the two brothers, uh, their, their uncle was the worst, and then so, they, so then he convinced their dad to kick them out, so he kicked them out. Then, um... Uh, then the, then our, then our good, good foster dad, homeboy, hunter, man, person, wow, um, <laughs> he raised them and then let them go off with a dog that was apparently forgotten about the rest of the story, and then because they were nice and didn't want to kill a bunch of baby animals, they then started a walking menagerie, blink, and then parted ways using the cool knife thingy. Um, and then they, they did that, and then we followed the one brother, who saved a princess by killing a dragon, then got murdered, then got his head put on backwards, and then was like, yo, I'm gonna eat all the king's stuff, and the innkeeper was like, what? And we left off. And he said, Sir Host, now I have eaten and drunk as the king eats and drinks, and now I will go to the king's court and marry the king's daughter. And that's where we left off, so let's get back right to it. Said the host, How can that be when she already has a betrothed husband and when the wedding is to be solemnized today? Then the hunter drew forth the handkerchief which the king's daughter had given him on the dragon's hill, and which were folded the monster's seven tongues, and said, That which I hold in my hand shall help me to do it. Then the innkeeper looked at the handkerchief and said, Whatever I believe, I do not believe that, and I am willing to stake my house and courtyard on it. The hunter, however, took a bag with a thousand gold pieces, put it on the table, and said, I stake that on it. Now the king said to his daughter at the royal table, What did all the wild animals want, which have been coming to you and going in and out of my palace? She replied, I may not tell you, but send and have the master of these animals brought, and you will know. The king sent a servant to the inn and invited the stranger, and the servant came just as the hunter had laid his wager with the innkeeper. Then said he, Now, Sir Host, the king sends his servant and invites me, but I do not go in this way. He said to the servant, I request the lord king to send me royal clothing and a carriage with six horses and servants to attend me. When the king heard the answer, he said to his daughter, What shall I do? She said, Have him fetched as he desires to be, and you will do well. Then the king sent royal apparel, a carriage with six horses and servants to wait on him. When the hunter saw them coming, he said, See, Sir Host, now I am fetched as I desired to be. And he put on the royal garments, took the handkerchief with the dragon's tongues with him, and drove him off to, uh, drove off to the king. When the king saw him coming, he said to his daughter, How shall I receive him? She answered, Go to meet him, and you will do well. Then the king went to meet him and led him in, and his animals followed. The king gave him a seat near himself and his daughter, and the marshal, as bridegroom, sat on the other side, but no longer knew the hunter. And now at this very moment, the seven heads of the dragon were brought in as a spectacle, and the king said the seven heads were cut off the dragon uh, by the marshal. Therefore today I give him my daughter as wife. The hunter stood up, opened the seven mouths, and said, Where are the seven tongues of the dragon? Then the marshal was terrified, and grew pale, and knew not what to answer, and at length in his anguish he said, Dragons have no tongues. The hunter said, Liars ought to have none, but the dragon's tongues are the tokens of the victor. And he unfolded the handkerchief, and there lay all seven inside it. And he put each tongue in the mouth to which it belonged, and it fitted exactly. Then he took the handkerchief, on which the name of the princess was embroidered, and showed it to the maiden, and asked to whom she had given it, and she replied to the man who killed the dragon. Then he called his animals, and took uh, the collar off each of them, and the golden clasp from the lion, and showed them to the maiden, and asked to whom they belonged. She answered, The necklace and golden clasp were mine, but I divided them among the animals who helped to conquer the dragon. And then the hunter said, When I, tired with the fight, was resting and sleeping, the marshal came and cut off my head. 
Then he carried away the king's daughter and pretended that it was he who had killed the dragon, but with the tongues, the handkerchief, and the necklace, I proved that he lied. And then he related how his animals had healed him by the means of a wonderful root, and how he had traveled about with them for one year, and at length again come there and had learnt the treachery of the marshal by the innkeeper's story. Then the king asked his daughter, Is it true that this man killed the dragon? And she answered, Yes, it is true. Now I can reveal the wicked deed of the marshal, as it has come to light, for he wrung me a promise to be silent. For this reason, however, I made the condition that the marriage should not be solemnized for a year and a day. Then the king bade twelve counselors be summoned who were to pronounce judgment on the marshal, and they sentenced him to be torn to pieces by four bulls. Um, the marshal was therefore executed, but the king gave his daughter to the hunter and named him his uh, viceroy over the whole kingdom. The wedding was celebrated with great joy, and the young king sent for his father and his foster father and loaded them with treasures. He sent for the innkeeper too and said, Now, sir host, I have married the king's daughter in your house and yard are mine. The host said, Yes, according to justice it is so. But the young king said, It shall be done according to mercy, and told him that he should keep his house and yard and gave him the th thousand gold uh, pieces as well. And now the young king and queen were thoroughly happy and lived in gladness together. He often went out hunting because it was a delight to him, and the faithful animals had to accompany him. In the neighborhood, however, there was a forest of which it was reported that it, uh, it was haunted, that whoever entered it did not easily get out again. The young king, however, had a great inclination to hunt in it, and let the old king have no peace until he allowed him to do so. So he rode forth with a great following, and when he came to the forest, he saw a snow-white deer, and said to his people, Wait here until I return. I want to chase that beautiful creature. And he rode into the forest after it, and followed only by his animals. The attendants halted and waited until evening, but he did not return, so they rode home and told the young queen that the young king had followed a white deer into the enchanted forest and had not come back again. Then she had the greatest concern about him. He, however, had still continued to ride on and on after the beautiful wild animal and had never been able to overtake it, and when he thought he was near enough to aim, he instantly saw it bound away into the far distance, and at length it vanished altogether. And now he perceived that he had penetrated deep into the forest and blew his horn, but he received no answer for his attendants could not hear it. And as night too was falling, he saw that he could not get home that day, so he dismounted from his horse, lighted himself a fire near a tree, and resolved to spe spend the night uh, by it. While he was sitting by the fire and his animals were lying down beside him, it seemed to him that he heard a human voice. He looked round, but could perceive nothing. Soon afterwards, he again heard a groan as if from above, and then he looked up and saw an old woman sitting in the tree, who wailed unceasingly, Oh, 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 how cold I am! Said he, Come down and warm yourself if you are cold. But she said, No, your animals will bite me. He answered, They will do you no harm, old mother. Do come down. She, however, was a witch. He said, I will throw down a wand from the tree, and if you strike them on the back with it, they will do me no harm. And then she threw him a small wand, and he struck them with it, and instantly they lay still and were turned into stone. And then the witch was safe from the animals. She leapt down and touched him also with a wand and changed him to stone. Thereupon she laughed and dragged him and his animals into a vault, where many more stones already lay. As, however, the young king did not come back at all, the queen's anguish and care grew constantly greater, and it so happened that at this very time the other brother, who had turned to the east when they were separated, came into the kingdom. He had sought a home and found none, and had then traveled about here and there, and had made his animals dance. Then it came into his mind that he would just go and look at the knife that they had thrust in the trunk of the tree at their parting, that he might learn how his brother was. When he got there, his brother's side of the knife was half rusted and half bright. Then he was alarmed and thought a great misfortune must have befallen my brother, but perhaps I can still save him, for half of the knife is still bright. He and his animals traveled towards the west, and when he entered the gate of the town, the guard came to meet him, and asked if he was to announce him uh, to his consort, the young queen, who had for a couple of days been in a, the greatest sorrow about his staying away and was afraid he had been killed in the enchanted forest. The sentries, indeed, thought no otherwise than that he was the young king himself, for he looked so like him and had wild animals running behind him. Then he saw that they were speaking of his brother and thought, It will be better if I pass myself off as him, and then I can rescue him more easily. So he allowed himself to be escorted into the castle by the guard and was, was received with the greatest joy. The young queen indeed thought that he was her husband, and asked him why he had stayed away so long. He answered, I had lost myself in a forest, and could not find my way out again any sooner. At night he was taken to the royal bed, but he laid a two-edged sword between him and the young queen. She did not know what that could mean, but did not venture to ask. 
He remained in the palace a couple of days, and in the meantime inquired into everything which related to the enchanted forest, and at last he said, I must hunt there once more. The king and the young queen wanted to persuade him not to do it, but he held out against them and went forth with a large following. Then he had got into the forest. Everything happened with him as with his brother. He saw a white dirt and said to his people, Stay here and wait until I return. I want to chase the lovely wild beast. And then he rode into the forest and his animals ran after him. But he could not overtake the deer and got so deep into the forest that he was forced to pass the night there. And when he had lighted a fire, he heard someone wailing above him, Oh, 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 how cold I am. Then he looked up and the same witch was sitting in the tree. Said he, If you are cold, come down, little old mother, and warm yourself. She answered, No, your animals will bite me, but he said, They will not hurt you. Then she cried, I will throw down a wand to you, and if you strike them with it, they will do me no harm. When the hunter heard that, he had no confidence in the old woman, and said, I will not strike my animals. Come down, or I will fetch you. Then she cried, What do you want? You shall not touch me. But he replied, If you do not come, I will shoot you, said she. Shoot away, I do not fear your bullets. Then he aimed and fired at her, but the witch was proof against all uh, leaden bullets, and laughed, and yelled and cried, You shall not hit me. And the hunter knew uh, what to do, tore three silver buttons off his coat, and loaded his gun with them, for against them her arts were useless. And when she fired, when he fired, she fell down at once with a scream. Then he set his foot on her and said, Old witch, if you do not, do not instantly confess where my brother is, I will seize you with both my hands and throw you into the fire. She was in a great fright, begged for mercy, and said, He and his animals lie in a vault turned to stone. Then he compelled her to go there with him, threatened her, and said, Old witch, now you shall make my brother and all the human beings lying here alive again, or you shall go into the fire. She took a wand and touched the stones. And then his brother with his animals came to life again, and many others, merchants, artisans, and shepherds, arose, thanked him for their deliverance, and went to their homes. But when the uh, twin brothers saw each other again, they kissed each other and rejoiced with all their hearts. Then they seized the witch, bound her, and laid her on the fire. When she was burnt, the forest opened of its own accord and was light and clear, and the king's palace could be seen at about the distance of a three hours' walk. After this, the two brothers went home together, and on the way they told each other their histories. And when the youngest said that he was a ruler of the whole country, and the king said, the other observed, That I learned very well, for when I came to the town and was taken for you, all royal honors were paid me. The young queen looked at me as her husband, and I had to eat at her side and sleep in your bed. When the other heard that, he became so jealous and angry that he drew his sword and struck off his brother's head. But when he saw him lying there dead and saw his red blood flowing, he repented most violently. My brother saved me, cried he, and I have killed him for it, and he bewailed him aloud. Then the hare came and offered to go and bring some of the root of life, and bound it away and brought it while there was still time, and the dead man was brought to life again and knew nothing about the wound. After this they journeyed onwards, and the youngest said, You look like me, have royal apparel on as I have, the animals follow you as they do me. We will go in by opposite gates and arrive at the same time from the two sides in the aged king's presence. So they separated, and at the same time came the watchman from the other, uh, from the one door and from the other, and announced that the young king and the animals had returned from the chase. The king said, It is not possible. The gates lie quite a mile apart. In the meantime, however, the two brothers entered the courtyard of the palace from opposite sides and both mounted the steps. Then the king said to the daughter, Say which is your husband. Each of them looks exactly like the other. I cannot tell. Then she in great distress and could not tell. But at last she remembered the necklace which had given, she had given to the animals, and she sought for and found her little golden clasp on the lion, and she cried in her delight, He who is followed by this lion is my true husband. Then the young king laughed and said, Yes, he is the right one. And they sat down together and ate and drank and were merry. At night, when the young king went to bed, his wife said, Why have you for these last nights always laid a two-edged sword in our bed? I thought you had a wish to kill me. Then he knew how true his brother had been. Okay, what do I want to say? Other than I loved it, I loved it. Why, why do we never hear this story? It was brilliant, it was entertaining. You learn things. There were animals that talked. There was a dragon, there was a princess. There, there are brothers, there's a witch, there's a huntsman. Like, it is literally the, you know, it is like, most of the fairy tale tropes that we have are are found here. If there had been dwarves, hands down 110%. This is just the fairy tale trademarked. No going back. My goodness.
goodness, I loved it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And okay, okay. What do I want to say? What do I want to say? First off, if you see a magical looking deer, don't go after it into spooky woods. Just don't. It might work out for you in the end, but like it's it's not gonna be fun. But so you see, so you know, you know. Um. You know. Yeah, let's let's talk on that for a minute, cause let's be real. Let's let's be completely honest right now with each other. Me me to you, you to me. We have people like that in our lives. We are constantly seeking this golden standard of person, of uh, significant other, best friend, parent child whatever we all have this ideal in our head that we're chasing and sometimes we chase so hard and so much that we lose everything around us because we won't let it go and that's sad really sad and it makes it very easy for people to take advantage of us like here he was chasing the deer so much that he's like I have to stop here and then the witch is like you I'm cold. He's like, yeah, sure, whatever, come down by the fire. And then BAM! Bad news. You know, you understand me? So, it's a fine balance, because on the one hand, we've got this golden standard that if we chase way too much, we lose everything around us. On the other hand, eh, not having standards at all, like not having a standard at all so you're like yeah this person said hi to me once yeah we'll follow them for us and forever and then they hurt you and you're like it's fine it's not fine be in the middle yeah middle ground where you gotta party all the time and it's okay to be a little more but but definitely don't be I must have this or I will have nothing and don't be, I don't care what I have, give me something, please, I'm desperate. Both reek of desperation, and it's not a good smell on anybody. Anybody. Okay. Yeah, that was a fun, fun little analysis right there. Okay. Second. Like, come on. Like, you know, you vibe, you get that, uh... Like, if your twin showed up and was like, Yeah, I ate next to your wife and also totally slept in the same bed with her. You might be, you would be a little concerned. Yeah, you would be concerned. However, what if there had been no root of life? Because it says he repented violently. He was like, what have I done? This is terrible. I just murdered my brother. What if there had been no root of life? You know? Think about it. We don't get no root of life in this. Somebody, somebody needs to come up with that real quick or find that real quick, you know. But, you know, we don't have that. And sometimes we don't get it for relationships either. Things done in anger and spite and jealousy you typically can't take back. Typically speaking, you really you just can't take it back. If you're lucky, you're able to take it back and repair it. Find your relationship root of life trademarked. But, sometimes you're not, and you can't often tell when it's going to be one way or the other. So, be careful what you say and do in high emotion. Not really much to say. And, just come on. Think about how, how terrible, if they had not had a root of life, 
if they had not had a root of life and he gets home and he finds out that his brother was like the truest and most faithful and like literally put like a barrier between him and the woman's of his brother because he thought that he could save his brother and like like he was the the greatest TM trademarked how terrible would he have felt like he probably felt terrible for doing it and then found out he was great but like how terrible would he have felt if he'd found out that he had literally reacted for nothing because he didn't ask clarifying questions and check the facts now sometimes the situation is exactly what it looks like but you never know until you check the facts and find out for yourself right and it's better to do that than murder somebody okay um, is there anything else I want to say? Dude, that innkeeper does not know when to quit. Like, he already saw... Like, he already saw that he could get, like, the king's wine, the king's confectionery, whatever, like, cake, pie, I don't know what it was, it just said confectionery. You know, like, he got everything the king's, and then he was like, and I'm totally gonna go marry her. Um... How did he not figure that, like, there was something else going on? I don't know. Don't bet against a man you've already seen prove your bets wrong. Like, he could have totally lost his entire um, inn and house and livelihood because he just was so skeptical. So, on the one hand, don't trust everything you see. On the other hand, don't distrust everything you see. Middle ground. Party in the middle ground. That's where, that's where it lies. Um. Yeah. I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Good story. Uh, 17 out of 10. Would read again. All of the time. It was good. Woo! Alright. Um, yeah, it was fun. And with that... Um, thank you for joining us for another Happily Ever After, or Not So Happily Ever After. Um, that's up for you to decide, and what you decide is valid, because you're valid. You are. Uh, either way, this is the end for this episode, so tune in later, and we can learn more and turn a new page together.